There we go. I should be able to uh, go through this okay. Okay, well, I'm going to be uh, talking about the uh, uh, IBT and some improvements I've been uh, doing to it. So it's hardly an IBT anymore with uh, you know, some of the changes. But anyway, I want to talk about the uh, possibilities of what I've done there. So it's the Vulture's Roost Radio Observatory is what I call it because of the uh, creatures hanging up there. Uh, there we go. We're working. All right, so we're out the quest to improve the IBT, and we got a, a little picture of a famous uh, Spanish knight of uh, legend there and pursuing his activity. And, you know, sometimes I wonder if I'm kind of like that in pursuing some of this with the IBT. But anyway, we're going to go forward with uh, what I'm doing here. Okay, first, uh, what's the IBT? It's our uh, you know, educational toy that's been with uh, you know, Sierra for quite a few years now. I think. Uh, Way back, Chuck Forrester started us on that, and other people, Tom Crowley's kind of the main moving force now. But anyway, uh, uh, there are some limitations in that, and I'm trying to see how much of an instrument I can make out of it. Uh, so the things you run into, satellite finders uh, around there, they give a good indication of satellites, but they don't really give a very good uh, you know, measurement of signal level. So I've uh, considerably improved that on the uh, subject of uh, pointing accuracy. Uh, I've done a lot in uh, you know, that area uh, there. Uh, ground noise, uh, a little bit there. And next question, can we get some kind of calibration on the thing and not just have it kind of a uh, all, you know, little better than random number that comes out of it? Okay, so, so this is a satellite finder that I had uh, built up and it's been through several iterations. This is iteration one, or actually this is the diagram before I actually produced the first one when it was kind of a proposed thing there. But uh, based on an Arduino, a DC amplifier, and a uh, log amplifier, uh, uh, which is the uh, detector stage of it. So all of this did a lot there, meter output, output to sky pipe, a few other things there. So take a look at the 8318. And you can see I've got that little red slider there going across. Uh, in the original version, the ADC was going to take some segment of that range there, and it would take the segment that matches what's coming out of the particular uh, LNB and basically expand it out. Okay, so I look at this uh, log detector, some of the advantages of using that type of uh, IC. It's a uh, uh, you know, pretty sophisticated IC. It has a, you know, it's temperature stable. It's intended for cell site uh, power control. So it needs a lot of accuracy and a lot of cell site equipment is in less than desirable uh, environment. So it's pretty temp good on temperature stability. Uh, it allows a smooth scale adjustment, uh, you know, because of the uh, very accurate log curve on it. Uh, Okay, so that one of the results is the ADC count is a constant percent change in power for each count. Uh, and with this, I can go to an exponential lookup table and have something reads out directly proportional to temperature, which is what we actually do here. And we went to a new uh, ADD converter on this of what I've used before. It's a 16-bit, and uh, uh, Ed Harfman actually worked with me a little bit on this one. Uh, yeah, I was kind of hung on, uh, you know, 12 bits is good enough, 16-bit costs more. But uh, Ed had the idea that maybe we could eliminate the DC amplifier and some other components by using better accuracy than needed and move some functions to software. And first, I wasn't real sure of that, and a little encouraging from Ed and I, uh, you know, ran through the numbers and said, yeah, that's actually a good idea. So this device is an integrating ADC, so it's got a, a kind of an averaging function in it. The original 10-bitter in the uh, Arduino is kind of a snapshot in time. It takes the uh, voltage at an instant in time and converts it, whereas this averaging is much better for a signal that has some noise in it. Uh, there's a programmable gain setting, and uh, I had set it in this application for plus or minus two volts, which worked out right. It's got a differential input uh, between two uh, analog pins, and that allows you to cancel out any uh, ground noise, because anytime you uh, start working with low-level signals, that's a problem. And, you know, I squared C interface to the Arduino, which it already has a hardware for that. As a matter of fact, uh, Adafruit uh, people actually wrote a driver for it, and, uh, you know, I actually bought the board from them, even though it was a couple bucks more, just because they supplied me with a uh, driver there.
No, take a look at the uh, log detector of, you know, with an offset voltage first. I mean, we had the output of it with an offset voltage. And as we change this offset, it would change which part of the ADC range I take. And uh, let's take a, do a little math here to find that added offset as log G. Once you get a uh, voltage or a number, either one, you assign some function to its scale factor. So we're going to call this log G, where G is gain. All right, then the ADC input in the original thing was, you know, log T, log of the temperature, which is what's coming out of there, you know, indirectly, but that's what it really is, plus the log G. So, of course, characteristics of the log, that's the log of T times G. Then in Arduino software, we've got an analog uh, function. And so that result is temperature times some gain or scale factor. So that's how we scale our temperature, just by moving that offset around, it'll set the full scale temperature. Now for the uh, new, a, uh, new ADC here, uh, ah, what I do? There. For the new ADD converter, uh, you know, 16 bit ADD converter, that went straight to the detector. So the full range of the detector is there now. And then the offsetting function is done in software. So that's a digital something rather than an analog amp. And then that, of course, goes to the power function before. So it's basically the same math, except that we've moved that summing function uh, and scaling function associated with it to software, uh, which software doesn't drift like analog amplifiers. End result, uh, we eliminated all of this, uh, you know, stuff here. And, uh, you know, uh, some, of, some of it was related to, like, this was related to the uh, PWM that I was using to produce the offset voltage on the Arduino was sensitive to power supply voltage. You plug the thing into a computer, the USB voltage is unstable. So the only thing I could do is go to a regulated voltage for the PWM and all this junk got added. Uh, you know, this was just to do the scaling there. And uh, this got more complicated because I had to move the A to D converter to 3.3 volts instead of 5. So I got kind of a, a mess of analog stuff there that all went away when, as soon as I went to the uh, new converter. Oops. So this is a kind of a sketch of what the signal flow is like through the thing. We got the converter. And notice I've got the... Uh, uh, one of the inputs of the converter tied to the ground right at the log detector. So any difference in the voltage between ground here, 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 or inside here anywhere is immaterial because uh, uh, this is measuring the voltage of ground and comparing it against the detector voltage. So that differential uh, uh, gained a whole lot as far as that goes. And this converter is, uh, although it runs on five volts, it's uh, got its own internal reference and it's independent of the five volt supply. It doesn't care if it's on three volts or five volts. It does exactly the same thing. So good converter for that. And went through a bunch of math. So I got the offset operation, sky pipe interface, and uh, uh, tone output, uh, you know, PWM to run a meter. Or so I do like an analog meter for demo purposes. Uh, also come uh, that and the tone help and setup. I added a new function that wasn't there before. I call it kind of an auto zero offset. I'm not sure exactly what the correct terminology is, but it basically moves this offset up and down until the meter is within scale. So you don't have to crank on the knob here to get it in place. That saved a lot of time. However, if that button is accidentally hit, it makes a mess. So I put a little shield around it so it's not real easy to hit. Okay, 8318 detector. Did run into a few problems with that. It's a very sensitive device at the low end, and cell phones are everywhere. And even if cell phones weren't near it, it seemed like the readings would jump around until I put it inside of a shielded box. So I've got the shielded box, feed through capacitors to bring uh, things in and out of the box there, because that was the uh, uh, only way I could, uh, you know, keep uh, cell phone signals out is good feed throughs. Uh, okay, I had the power ground was now done right at that. That board was mounted on kind of an odd way so I could put a low pass filter. And the low pass filter was so I could use it with uh, four gigahertz LNBs where the uh, uh, local oscillator would leak in there. And the 12 gigahertz stuff, that's uh, totally immaterial. Okay, reference ground. This black wire right here, notice it's grounded right at this board. 
goes out through feed through capacitor and did the AD converter. So that gets rid of uh, yeah, that problem. Okay, I uh, have problems with uh, uh, the box here, it had a resonant frequency somewhere, and this thing has a lot of gain, so at very low levels, gain on this would run up and get real low level oscillation. And I put some pieces of refrigerator magnet in the corner of the box there. And that that is actually a quite great absorber. It's not characterized as such, so you got to fiddle with it a little, but it does work real well. Then the 82 ohm resistor, uh, I did a uh, accidentally ran out of experience and managed to short the five volt supply on the Arduino while this thing was running. So I had 12 volts powering this thing. And uh, so it's put an output signal, the Arduino is powered down and the ADD converter didn't like that. It got too much current down its input and checking the data sheet, if I put a small resistor in there, that would keep it from uh, you know, latching up. Fortunately, although the ADD converter got hot, it didn't destroy it as soon as I turned it off and let it cool, it didn't work, but that can destroy a part pretty easy. Ready, aim, observe. I, you know, for sighting originally, I had uh, for daylight use, I had just a little chunk of fiberglass sitting with a magnet here so that it wouldn't get uh, broke all the time and use the shadow of the sun on this piece for that, for sighting things in daylight, just sight down it, worked pretty good. But sighting the moon at night, because I was wanting to uh, do some more serious moon measurements on it, uh, it was uh, really not very easy to see at night. So I went and bought one of the red dot finders like you commonly see on uh, small optical telescopes, it puts a little red dot on the sky. And bright daylight, the red dot finder wasn't any good, but the regular sights looked pr work pretty good. At night, interestingly enough, the moon outshines the brightest red uh, dot setting and you could find anything except the moon, which is the thing I always wanted to find. So that kind of didn't work out either. The uh, rifle scope I found was really the uh, best finder for a moon sighting. It has a little uh, reticle thing in it that you can uh, either get a uh, dark cross here or turn on a switch and you get either a red or green soft cross here that you can change the level of. So no matter how bright or dim the moon is uh, due to phases or whatever, you can still sight on it. Because I wanted to be able to sight on the moon accurately. And accurately and uh, quickly aim on it because I had uh, run through two solar eclipses or two that's all, lunar eclipses with this, uh, you know, making measurements. And one of the problems I found was I wanted to move off of the moon to get a background noise, you know, background level, and then back on the moon. And getting back on the moon accurately and quickly uh, was more difficult than I wanted. This proved to be the easiest thing. You do have to get used to where the uh, exit pupil is on it, but other than that, it uh, it works real well. So aiming at the sun uh, needs something. And uh, a lot of people use the shadow of the feet on the dish, which is also a good way, but I already have this sitting out here. So it just made a little plastic screen there, but a, a black mark, uh, which is you know, around the screw when it was aimed right on the sun. So now I can quickly aim at the sun because the other thing I am wanting to do is some uh, solar flux measurements on that. So That'll again allow me to go back and forth between cold sky and the sun more rapidly there. Then dish back lobes. Uh, first we had uh, my experiment in uh, July of 2019, which was uh, in a presentation. Uh, when I put this mess of cardboard and aluminum foil behind the IBT, uh, it uh, resulted in about seven degrees K, K uh, uh, lower uh, sky temperature. So that was a pretty significant improvement in uh, you know, background, uh, especially considering things in the background could be pets that move, people, other such things. So that 7K in the background is not necessarily stable. So anyway, that helped stabilize things. However, this thing you can see was held together with clothespins and fell apart. It's kind of a, a quick proof of principle and I could put it on and off quickly to verify the uh, thing or I said, yeah, I need something better than that. What's being done? And you always look at what other people have uh, done. You don't want to uh, uh, reinvent the wheel. So we had uh, Alex, as we just spoke, and he told us a little bit about how he had shielded around the dish. And you saw how significant improvements he saw on that. And uh, so I looked at uh, how he had put it on there, the four uh, you know segments there, and I did similar. And 
Then I looked at what uh, you know, Dr. Weimer had been, uh, you know, the group had done on the, uh, uh, you know, what DSA 2000 thing. I think he's going to talk a little about the preamp and stuff with us. But that is a very interesting shield to keep ground noise and EMP out. Because, you know, look, it's kind of sculptured. It's not just a straight thing. And when you're making 2000 of those, the fact that it's sculptured, uh, you know, uh, you know, costs you some money. And uh, you know, when you're making 2,000 of it, it adds up. So that was carefully optimized. And you look at the noise specs on that thing, and it is very low, you know, background noise. So besides having his super preamp in there, he's keeping ground noise out. So I'm hoping he presents some on uh, that uh, shield at a later time there. We'll see. So anyway, I made a, a little aluminum ring uh, uh, around. Ah do that all the time. Made a uh, ring out of aluminum here. That was actually, uh, you yeah, know, put some furring strip uh, lumber on there, piece of it to hold it. And actually made a little mistake with that, that this is slightly shallow compared to the parabola of the dish. Now I should have went on the deep side. Uh, that would have been a little bit better shielding, I think. But anyway, uh, you don't want uh, it exactly uh, on the parabola, because that would cause uh, the bright aluminum foil to focus on your uh, uh, LNB. So there it is, a cable TV thing. That was a connector that had died uh, uh, for splicing two pieces of half-inch cable. I had some scraps of half-inch cable around. So the dead connector still holds the ends together. Electrical connection doesn't matter. Uh, looking back on it, I probably would have grabbed a piece of PEX plumbing pipe and wrapped it around. It would have made a good ring for supporting the thing as well. I cut up a, uh, ah, there we go again. So I cut up a bunch of cardboard and uh, got the roll of aluminum foil and a little uh, you know, contact cement glued it on there. Put this little yellow tab there, which is a piece of cardboard held on with packing tape. And that was in just the right place that it could be pulled down to the rim of the dish and held with a binder clip like used for a stack of papers. So that would hold it in place securely, but yet I could uh, take it on and off quickly. So there's my finished uh, you know, shield thing around there. And it probably goes out a little little further than needed. And like I said, putting it at a steeper angle would have been better. Uh, this turns up focusing you know, the sun, when it's on the sun, it focuses just up above the top of the LNB, uh, mostly for the sunlight, because this isn't perfectly steady. So it's not exactly the right place. Would have made it deeper. I could have put the focus about halfway between the dish surface and the uh, LNB there. And then the light reflect off the sun would have just went by and wouldn't have resulted in any uh, temperature thing. Anyway, from going at this, it did lower the uh, temperature of the instrument by 16.7 K, which has a little excess accuracy, but that was averaging a bunch of readings between uh, you know, cold sky with and without the uh, shield around there. Uh, and with, uh, you know, just elevation, just a little bit off the trees, I got 9.2 Kelvin out of a you know, bunch of averages there. So I think a pretty good improvement there. Next question is, can we calibrate the IBT? Uh, one, to uh, be able to actually, uh, you know, do some calibration on the thing, uh, get a little more, uh, you know, accurate. I, you know, I was hoping to actually be able to, uh, with the IBT, uh, go through the uh, moon phases and, uh, you know, show the, uh, you know, some change from the phase of the moon of the uh, temperature of the moon, because I can easily see the temperature of the moon with this. But, and the other thing I was uh, interested in is that solar flux, although it doesn't change as much at 10 gigahertz as it does at, uh, uh, you know, 2800 megahertz or 1400 megahertz, uh, you know, it does have some change. And, uh, you know, if you have something to, you know, calibrate against, you should be able to tell what it is. So look at uh, how would you calibrate 408 and 1420 megahertz. Uh, I've actually done the calibration at 408 myself. I've helped somebody else set up a 1420 calibration. But uh, have a directional coupler. So you have the signal coming from the antenna through the coupler there and into the receiver. The test signal and noise source about 10,000 Kelvin, enough padding and the correction uh, coupling factor here uh, for 
400 megahertz you want uh, in the area of 100 K is not a bad calibration temperature. So you get a 20 dB coupler here, 100 to one, and that leaves very little noise from the termination getting in there. And uh, leaves a, you know, a couple dB of padding here in the noise source, and you can get 150 to 100 Kelvin pretty easy and adjust it with the pad. At 1420, uh, you want a coupler with a lower you know, coupling factor or more dB down so that your termination noise doesn't become you know, part of the receiver noise. So a 30 dB coupler, and this, that's a thousand to one, a 10,000 uh, degree noise source. So uh, need just a little bit of padding here and you can get in the uh, right area with that. Uh, that uh, directional coupler, by the way, is something I probably wouldn't want to leave in my hand carry bag going through the airport. It just looks a little sinister, I think. So looking at uh, calibration at 12 gigahertz, uh, the idea of using the directional coupler, first the LNBs don't have any really good way to uh, inject a uh, known amount of uh, signal. And the amount that I've been going on is, uh, or the you know, whole approach is put some absorber near the surface of the dish. Uh, if you take a look at uh, earth science uh, radiometers, uh, uh, like they use in satellites for uh, probing temperatures in hurricanes or uh, you know, that sort of a thing, uh, you know, they uh, uh, use, when they're making them, they use a uh, uh, large absorber for uh, calibrating. In the, Absorber sometimes put at 77 Kelvin in liquid nitrogen for part of the cycle. Other times at some other temperature, they'll use multiple temperatures, but they'll use microwave absorber. So anyway, I'm looking at the approach of going. Oops, what did I do there? Grabbed hold of something accidentally here. There. Anyway. So I'm looking at the uh, route of an absorber that covers just part of the surface of the dish. So the absorber will be at uh, 300 Kelvin temperature roughly or ambient temperature, which will mean, of course, I'll have to have a thermometer out there to know what the temperature of it is so I can uh, calculate that. Okay, and if I, the absorber's quite a bit less in the area of the dish, then here would be my effective temperature. So I can get a temperature anything lower than ambient by some percentage just by scaling that. Uh, so dish area is probably 55, 70% of the actual area as far as effective area. And the uh, absorber area, I'll of course adjust until I get the result I want. Now you still need something to kind of use as a calibration to start with. And again, I don't have a large surface area, high accuracy absorber to use like you might have in an EMI lab or something. Uh, so anyway, area of dense vegetation, and I think several people have uh, you know, verified dense ver vegetation is a pretty good uh, you know, reference and uh, checking out dense vegetation all around my house because I have a lot of forest near me. And no matter where I point at the forest, I seem to get the uh, same you know, temperature. So I'm assuming that's pretty close to our uh, you know, local uh, you know, actual temperature here in uh, Kelvin. All right, what did I do here? I can't get it to move. There. Okay, so I'm looking at calibration target. What the uh, calibration target, looking at the thing from uh, what's done on, uh, you know, earth science radiometers and, uh, you know, other measurement radiometers, they want their uh, calibration target to be pretty well free of reflections. Or in other words, it looks like a free space at 377 ohms put in front of something. Uh, and so it says an absorber, you have to be careful. You can uh, easily turn it up with an impedance that's lower than free space. And that will affect uh, LNA uh, tuning and uh, noise figures some. So that becomes a problem. Uh, yeah, all the references I looked at uh, uh, showed the use of uh, pyramid shaped uh, absorbers, just like the ones you see in uh, EMI labs. And uh, uh, quite a few references that said, don't even uh, think about using a flat panel reflector because you'll have like a, a 20 dB down or so at the reflection and that will, you know, if it's, you know, shown put in there as a reflector and that will uh, uh, keep it from being an accurate absorber and keep it from uh, uh, leaving the LNA well enough alone. So look at absorbers, uh, you get the, uh, uh, first, radar cross-section is different from uh, you know, black body thermal source or an absorber. Uh, 
There's some people will think they might be the same. Oh, they got a magic plate paint the military puts on their airplanes and they don't show up on uh, radar. In fact, they've got some absorption in their surface, but a lot of scattering is used there. And you do not want any scattering at all in a calibration target. You want it to be, you know, really, uh, you know, stable things. So uh, the only way you can make that is uh, cones like this uh, is what really makes it good. These cones need to be at least uh, about two wavelengths long to be really effective. Below that, they begin to uh, get it. Now, so what they're doing is as a wave, you know, if you imagine that as a wave hitting it, when a wave hits it, at first it just hits the tips, and as it travels further down, it kind of closes down on it, and that results in a very good absorption, uh, at, at least in a direction normal to the dish, which is uh, what we need. So that's what you see in anechoic chambers at test labs, where you take your computerized product and have the uh, test lab beat it up and tell you how much radio noise you have coming out of it. Uh, I was looking for an absorber that's something easy to get a hold of and cheap and available. And things I tried were, uh, yeah, just a piece of wood from a uh, wood crate. Uh, I tried a fiberglass rod, uh, wood dowel, and uh, just a piece of uh, ferrite ring core that I had around and a couple different magnets, a refrigerator magnet. Yeah. All of these things had some absorption of uh, radio waves. Uh, fiberglass has enough absorption that I would not at 10 gigahertz put a fiberglass rod like that across the front of the dish because it'll make the noise temperature go up. Uh, so you wouldn't like to use it for uh, like a uh, feed support or uh, unless it's at the very edge to say the least. So then I look, oh, microwave popcorn. They've got an absorber there that uh, you know absorbs the microwaves, makes heat, and it is a pretty effective absorber. How you might, might notice it's also quite flat. And then I got steel wool, which is fairly common for wood woodworkers to use to, uh, 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 you know, as part of their finishing process. And you can get it in super fine, so it's very fine strands of steel. And steel is actually quite lossy at uh, RF, so that was the other absorber I tried. There's probably other common things I could try. Uh, I could probably try to scrounge some microwave absorbers from somebody in the business, but I wanted something commonly available so somebody else can uh, duplicate my results without special connections there. So there's where I tried the uh, power uh, cup popcorn heater and varied the height of that with blocks of styrofoam. Styrofoam is known from some other people's references. Uh, very low density styrofoam is very good at being almost air as far as that. So I built a bunch of spacers out of styrofoam in different heights, stacked them up to move this uh, around. I get anywhere from 30 to 70 degrees Kelvin from that uh, disc there. Obviously not a good calibration standard. Wood, when I laid it across there, I got 65 Kelvin. Now, when I lifted it up, I could make it uh, go up and down. Uh, so I'm obviously uh, not a good standard. Again, it doesn't have the depth to it. So there I took the uh, power cup and I graphed out the moving of it out. I unfortunately didn't have enough spacers, so I'm missing some points on this. So I have a very undersampled curve. But on the spreadsheet, I also put a... Uh, uh, cyclic pattern, which was one half wavelength repeating. And we can see there's roughly a one half wavelength repetition, repetition pattern to that reflection pattern as it goes from 30 to 70 degrees Kelvin. So that says there's some very significant reflections involved. And like I said, you do not want reflections in absorber because among other things, they're changing the uh, noise figure and gain of the uh, uh, LNB from their very presence there. You want the absorber to look more like a free space in other words, totally absorb. You know, an impedance mismatch, that's a gain error. Well, I took a ball of steel wool, and again, I did it with my whole collection of spacers there, anything from eight millimeters to 60 millimeters worth of spacer there. And uh, by the time I got to this, I picked up a couple extra spacers, got a few extra points. Now, I've got two curves here. This first one is what I actually measured for the temperature difference from throwing the steel wool pad in there. And the second one, I thought, that's interesting. It's got a rising with, well, the problem is that as I put it on the spacers, it's getting closer to the LNB. So, of course, it's got less space loss to it. So I took the distance to the uh, from the uh, uh, 
CO oil to the LMB and uh, you know, use it to a space loss correction, so to speak. That turned up a much better thing. I've still got a couple little irregularities in that. So it could be my measurement process, could be whatever. But it says the ball of steel wool there isn't bad. It's a constant, uh, uh, in fact, about 50 degrees Kelvin at the surface of the dish, uh, which is uh, uh, some, somewhat higher than I want for the uh, you know, moon. Really not, not bad for a, uh, a solar observation uh, standard. Uh, the other thing I need to protect the steel wool to make sure it doesn't get crushed or misshapen, which would uh, you know, change its calibration factor a little bit. I had thought, thought first that putting the steel wool on end so it had a, uh, you know, some taper to it would uh, result in a better thing, but it actually resulted in a little more ripple in the curve, and I'm not quite sure why that is. Again, I had the space adjustment in it. So it's looking like a ball of steel wool flat may do better than anything else. So I may just cut it smaller to get lower things uh, you know, there on the uh, uh, temperature. Uh, by the way, the moon on the, my uh, telescope is roughly four degrees Kelvin increase. So it's a pretty small increase in uh, temperature and getting a calibration source closer to the level of what you're measuring is always better. You, uh, you know, for one thing, I can set the full scale on the instrument lower. Uh, and the other thing is it just leaves it closer. So you uh, have less error from any errors in the uh, instrument process. So that's kind of where I am with the steel wool right now. So I'm looking kind of what, you know, what's a future in the calibration thing. At this time, it's definitely an ongoing uh, study. Uh, might be able to, uh, you know, do a sh shape that was supposed to be shaped steel wool, but anyway, uh, might be able to, you know, find some shape for the steel wool that gives it a uh, very low reflection effects there and uh, uh, stability for uh, uh, measurement. Or I might be able to make something shaped out of wood. Wood is a reasonable material to, you know, cut, saw, and file, and wood is pretty lossy at uh, 10 gigahertz. Uh, I'd have to be careful with wood to make sure it's finished in some way that moisture absorption doesn't change its lossiness. But uh, one of those things that is probably what I'm going for in the future. We'll see something in the future of the uh, Sarah Journal on that. So that's kind of it for the calibration. Yeah. One other thing I threw out here that uh, I really wanted to get some idea what the antenna pattern was like on the uh, uh, IBT and the uh, uh, antenna pattern. Well, it's an important uh, you know, part of the behavior of an instrument. Any side lobes are uh, significant, as I saw from things such as uh, the, the cat walking by and seeing the readings change. Oops, uh, there's a side lobe on the dish. The cat just walked through it. And cat being curious always has to investigate what you're doing. So it's usually around if I'm playing with a radio telescope in the yard. But anyway, uh, this old uh, uh, laying in my junk box, uh, don't know if it works as a radar detector, but the uh, local oscillator and it works. It's a, it was a Cobra trap shooter radar detector, about 1991 vintage. And uh, it was a super hat type of radar detector. So it's got a local oscillator. And a little research of the local oscillator is probably 11.56 gigahertz. Hey, that's right in the middle of the uh, uh, range. And uh, with this thing being, uh, look, if you look out the waveguide, you see there's just one diode down there. So it's a single balanced mixer, which means that if you get a, a two milliwatts of RF hitting the uh, mixer diode, you're going to have two milliwatts creeping out the antenna. So they probably left it creeping out the antenna, whatever level was legal. But anyway, it was very strong at 30 meters away. And that's why I ran into a fence and couldn't easily move further. But from the strength of that, at least 50 meters away, it would, uh, which is enough that you're in far field. So you could do some reasonable antenna measurements with this as a source there. Uh, you take a look at what's inside this. That, ah, did it again. There, get this. That is a... Uh, uh, probably a gun diode oscillator there or a DRO, something like that, some kind of oscillator at that frequency, then the mixer there. But uh, anyway, might be able to get a little more out of it messing with the injection screw for the mixer or something like that. But anyway, it does uh, give a useful signal source. Uh, unfortunately, later radar detectors did a better job of keeping the local oscillator from leaking because the 
police quickly got a radar detector detector. So the better radar detectors are the super hats, the local oscillator would leak, and they could detect that with a special receiver built to look for it and know that somebody had a radar detector. State of Virginia loved those apparently. Uh, but anyway, uh, the, if you happen to have a 91 vintage uh, or yeah, that type of vintage uh, radar detector laying around in the super hat type, it is probably a good signal source for IBT testing for whatever that's worth. And at this point, we're ready to go for questions. Hello? I want to know about this refrigerator magnet as a uh, absorber. Tell us about that. Uh, okay, well, refrigerator magnets are made out of a whole bunch of fine particles of magnetic material to make them a flexible material. And uh, uh, it turns out anything iron, uh, you know, especially finely powdered iron like you have in a refrigerator magnet, tends to be lossy at RF. And you know, I tested quite a few pieces of refrigerator magnet. Every one of them, uh, yeah, when I put it on the surface of the dish, it was quite lossy, but uh, not lossy enough to be a good calibration target. But putting it inside of the box that oscillated it, uh, you know, quieted it right down. And it's just because of the extremely fine iron in there. And the fact that it's magnetized, I don't think has a whole lot of effect on it as far as absorbing goes. And uh, that's not the first time I've heard of. I've seen several ham sorts in microwave stuff. Uh, you know, something's oscillating at, uh, you know, four gigahertz, uh, you know, preamp for, uh, you know, 150 megahertz oscillating at four or five gigahertz could throw a piece of refrigerator magnet in the corner of the box. Uh, kills uh, box resonance real good. So they start out really thin. I wonder if you could stack them. Uh, yeah, I did try stacking them to you know, see if I make calibration target. You might be able to stack them in uh, varying size pieces and get something that was uh, somewhat better. Like I said, I'm still uh, looking at what will make a good calibration target because I'm wanting to have something where I can measure the ambient temperature for today, you know, in the area where my calibration target is, so I know what its temperature is, uh, convert that into Kelvin in my spreadsheet when I finally, uh, you know, do the analysis, and, but throw this thing on the surface of the dish and I will need uh, something to hold the position accurate because, of course, the illumination of the dish is different across the surface, so you do need to keep it centered and fairly consistent on position, but you do want it so that it doesn't show the uh, reflections effect, because that will definitely make it inaccurate. So, so Alex had a Tupperware box uh, full of, I guess, foam or something like that. Any comments? Yeah, yeah, the CMOS foam there, uh, that's probably a reasonable you know, think because he's wanting a flat line calibration and it will pretty well do that. But knowing the actual temperature of that, uh, because the reflection would be a little different. The other thing is CMOS foam varies a whole lot in conductivity. Uh, some of it you can put an ohmmeter across and it looks like almost an open circuit or, you know, an open circuit unless probes are almost touching. And other pieces you can take a big block of it and go from edge to edge and see, uh, you know, 10K ohms or something like that. So the resistivity is a big unknown. So you basically got an unknown there, but it's uh, you know, for making the flat line calibration across a frequency range, I would suspect that's very good and he has been getting good results on it. But I don't think I'd try to make an actual temperature standard out of that. Again, I'm trying to make a temperature standard. I could throw this on the dish and I know that I added, uh, you know, six Kelvin, eight Kelvin, 10 Kelvin, whatever to the cold sky reading. And then if I look at the moon, I know what the scale factor is. So many divisions of, you know, scale change is so many degrees Kelvin. So if I carefully center it on the moon, I should be able to get reasonably accurate temperature on that. And, uh, you know, on the IPT thing, uh, you, know, you know, some previous stuff I said, uh, yeah, I said, well, you can see the sun with it. And with just the satellite finders, it's pretty hard to find the moon because you, uh, well, they were made for finding satellites and not for, uh, you know, looking for very small level level changes like that. But anyway, with the uh, IBT processor thing, I've got the small changes are actually quite manageable. So my next quest, like I said, like the famous night there, I'm going after trying to uh, measure the temperature change of the moon during the uh, uh, you know, phases of the moon. So anyway, I'll be proceeding forward with that, trying to do something. Uh, you know, like I said, it may, may be like the quest of a crazy night, but I'll have fun going after it. <laughs> 
the real education. Uh, do you have a source for all these uh, IBT dishes? Uh, what do you suggest? Uh, mine has been, uh, you know, you get things, somebody, uh, you know, stopped getting the, uh, uh, one of the satellite services and, uh, you know, the uh, satellite company doesn't bother to come pick up the dishes. They're too cheap because they're volume produced and it goes out. Uh, you know, one thing I did find on uh, dishes, you have to watch uh, the free haul, you haul it off dishes. A fair number of them will be dented or something. And, well, it's not going to focus, you know, so I actually ran into one of them that had two focal points on it, you know, looking at the sun, you know. Uh, yeah, you know, look at it carefully. Oh, it's kind of warped, you know. So you need to find one that's not warped. And some of the multi-satellite things, especially ones that have the bar across there with a whole bunch of feed horns, uh, they've got a complicated feed mechanism that uh, somehow or another a microprocessor in the satellite receiver calibrate uh, talks to the uh, microprocessor inside the uh, LNB and, you know, controls the settings of it. And that says that for just taking and putting, uh, you know, 12 volts on it through a bias T, uh, well, that's not going to hardly, uh, you know, uh, get it. And uh, the other thing, some of the multi-satellite things they have at the uh, feeds near the center are looking at a good parabola or very close to it. And as the feeds get out away from the center, the dish is some, effectively somewhat smaller and not quite as accurate of a parabola. The uh, whole surface was designed to be a good compromise for all the satellites. So you get very little loss on any satellites to get some. But the uh, satellite towards the outer side, the dish is actually effectively somewhat smaller. And like I said, trying to get those satellite things to uh, do anything. I spent a lot of time poking at them and said, now you get the ones that have one or two feed horns on them, and those you can uh, uh, generally uh, you know, get to work. So that's uh, what you're looking for. And like I said, uh, watch for dishes that somebody, uh, you know, satellite company abandoned it, won't come and, uh, come get it. I uh, canceled their service. and. And will you haul it off for me? Oh, yes. Okay. To add it to my toy box. So I've got a few of them laying around uh, to uh, experiment with. And the one that I'm using now is actually a half meter, one of the smaller ones. And uh, the ones with the half meter or 18 inch dish are actually somewhat easier to use because the LNB there, it's a single feed horn. It'll have one or two connectors on it. The two connectors will be just a uh, uh, you know, I think they're the different polarizations. I'm not sure, but uh, uh, you know, you can get in there and uh, you know use them quite easily. And the polarization, you run into something on the different feed horns. Some of them are linear polarization in line with the dish. Some of them are linear across the dish, horizontal and vertical. Kind of lose meaning when you're looking at space. Others are right hand circular. Some are left hand circular. But the sources that we're interested in looking at. Uh, uh, at that frequency range are generally so random polarized that your polarization doesn't matter. You're going to see about the same thing. It could affect the calibration process because circular, you'd have to make sure your calibration uh, target looks the same. Both directions are pretty close to it. But uh, And with a linear, you could have something where if you switched LNBs, but generally I just you know, pick one and use it. Uh, by the way, just another interesting uh, thought on these uh, things. Uh, we have that Starlink thing that uh, Elon Musk and uh, company are putting up there with uh, who knows how many millions of satellites. Well, a little exaggeration, but some large quantity of satellites that their downlink is in you know, you know, the frequency range where the uh, IBT is uh, running. So, uh, you know, we may find the IBTs have, uh, you know, too much satellite interference in the future. It's hard to say. Uh, when I've been taking measurements, cold sky measurements, I'll every once in a while see something where you just all of a sudden see something peak up a few degrees Kelvin and then go away. And it's fairly intermittent, but no matter where I am in the sky, it seems like I get that once in a while. And, uh, well, uh, Musk and crowd put their stuff in low Earth orbit, so it's continually uh, moving there. It must be fun to track it from the ground systems. But anyway, uh, so that may be our interference source for the future. You may be seeing little jumps in your IBT output, especially if you're trying to do something resembling precision measurements there. Okay. All right. Outstanding there, Bruce.